Hello uh, and good morning, or maybe even good night, all around the world. It's a great pleasure seeing you here live at the cyberspace and to be meeting you as a reader of Hans Christian Andersen. Me and my staff has been looking very much forward to this meeting. My name is uh, Jos or Johannes Mørgaard Fransen. I'm a professor and I'm head of the center for Hans Christian Andersen research at the University of Southern Denmark. So once again, uh, as warmly as possible, welcome to this live session. We, some researchers uh, from the Hans Christian Andersen Center, situated at the University of Southern Denmark, uh, will be ready now to answer your questions. And we have been looking very much forward to this. Maybe I should present the Hans Christian Andersen Center. Uh, we are doing research, of course, in the works and arts of Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, we are doing research in his biography, and we are doing research in the significance of Hans Christian Andersen around the world. We are researching in the significance of Andersen in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, all around the world. And because uh, he is well known all around the world and across cultures, and that's why it's possible to ask, who is Hans Christian Andersen in different cultures? How is the reading of Hans Christian Andersen in different cultures about the world? How does this culture reflect the stories of Andersen? And uh, that makes it possible to understand the cultures as well as their ways of communication uh, to each other through the mirror of understanding Andersen. So please be welcome at this live session. Yeah. Uh, should I say something now? Yeah. I just yeah. Well, well, I'll hand over the words to my colleague, Professor Jakob Berger. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was delayed because of a traffic accident. Accident. So I just landed, so to speak. So um, where do we go from here? Just start with the questions. Yes, I think so. And I've put some questions that. I was prepared to answer, yeah. and, 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 and then we can take them. Yes, okay. Well, there's a question from Lily Eilon, and the question is, what is the business of cutting people's heads off, literally and figuratively, at the, at the drop of the hat and so on? Uh, was this common pr procedure in the time of Hans Christian Anders, when Hans Christian Anders lived? Well, you might say at that time, we had very cruel uh, death penalties. We cut off people's heads. But I think first and foremost, it's, it's uh, in the story they are cut off their heads. Uh, but in fact, uh, as a matter of fact, Hans Christian Andersen uh, was, as a child, uh, he, he, he overviewed, he saw people cut off their or were cut off their heads. Yeah, he and witnessed he, one execution as a, yes. as a small boy. Yes, yeah. yes. And later on, when he was about 17 years, I think, his teacher uh, enforced him uh, to see another penalty, a uh, cruel penalty. So, so yes, uh, he knew about that. Yeah. But legal practice was changing at this time, so it wasn't an, uh, an everyday affair. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. Yes. But 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 the question, why I guess that the question refers to the decapitation of the witch in the in the tinderbox, and it, it's a, it's quite a shocking incident, and and there's nothing legal about it. Uh, she's not convicted. It's not a trial. He just does it. <laughs> um, and why does he do it? That's a good question. Why, why have children and adults accepted this incident in the tale for centuries, you could say? Um, but you might say it was, uh, it was a part of, uh, of the folk tales too. Yeah. They are very cruel. I mean, the, the cruelty 
of the folk tales uh, is a kind of convention. And I, I think you, you might, you could well say this is also an experiment. It's not the very first fairy tale Anderson wrote, but it is uh, the first tale in his first regular volume of fairy tales. So he, he, you could say he tackles the genre head on. Mm, yeah. um, there's this cruel incident which could be taken from an original folk tale, but now he's narrating stories for bourgeois children mm. as well as their parents. So you could say he's testing what can you get away with. Yeah, in yeah. a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and I, I think we'll refer return to the question: uh, Did Anna did Anderson write about the interpretation of his stories himself? No, he did not. But but his his even his early stories they are testing themselves, and they are reflecting on the fairy tale genre all the time. Also testing what can you get away with, and in, in that way they they are comment, commenting upon themselves, the fairy tales, and and that's the way. Mm. That he is, you could say, interpreting them. He yeah. lets themselves interpret themselves. Yeah, that's what he's doing. I think. So in that way, cutting off heads uh, is he, not a realistic thing. No, it's it's, it's he, a part of the genre. And he certainly got away with it. Yes, writing it this way. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And then then there's a question from Katie Ordeal. Um It says, mm. "I were wondering about the use of the numbers." The magic formula of, uh, for instance, the three, three the number three, the yeah. number three years. Is there any knowledge of where this symbolism came from, or has it always been ingrained in folk and fairy tales? Well, we know about a lot of uh, traditions uh, of stories from foreign cultures uh, where these numbers uh, do play a role. The three number of three, the number of seven. Maybe the number of number of seventeen, but I think the number three is a very special one, uh, and it's <clears throat> it's used in a lot of uh, 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 cultural significance in in the Holy Bible. There's uh, God, His Son, and the Holy Ghost, and so on. So it's the Holy Trinity, the Holy Trinity, yes. And of course, uh, folk tale culture goes way back before that. Yeah, uh, the New Testament. In the Arabian so, culture, so I, there's the seven number of yeah. seven, yes. Three might be a significant number across cultures dating yes. back to time immemorial. So so why why is this number significant? And I, I, I think uh, you could say there's there's something very universal about the number three as well as the number one and the number two. And the relationship between these three numbers, because you could say the one is a number and it's not a number mm -hmm. uh, in religious uh, and philosophical thinking discourse. You know, one is also the all, everything, the totality, yeah. and in that sense, not a number. Exactly. Then it is also a number, yeah. uh, and and two. The number two, you, then you have a regular number, but it's uh, it's you could say it's also a number which is not dynamic in any sense, uh, because well, when you look into the mirror, you see yourself. That's a double two, <laughs> uh, yeah. but it's you could say in a way it's also the number of narcissism. Exactly. And if you meet the other in a confrontation, one against one or one on one, as they say in football, well, <laughs> that's uh, that's then you could say potentially it's it's the struggle unto death. Yeah. 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 Like in the master slave dialectics of. Mm -hmm. Of Hegel, which is of course referring, but the, uh, the number three—that's the one number three. Much. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, that's the extra number. Yeah, and then you get the possibility of a dynamic situation. Exactly. Not narcissism, not the fight unto death, but now a story 
exactly. can yes. take place. And, and that might make complexity. Yeah. Because uh, there's yeah. one too much. So it's the first uh, number allowing for complexity mm. and heterogeneity. And I think another thing is that uh, uh, mathematics, modern mathematics, uh, well, is rooting in a way in mysticism, uh, mysterious, mysterious thoughts in the Middle Ages and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that that's that question. And um, Annette Pigman has been asking, as Christian Anderson traveled rightly, do any of his stories reflect this experience? Well, you might say almost all of his stories reflect uh, the traveling, the movement. Anderson had this very famous sentence, uh, to live is to travel, or to travel is to live. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a way of putting uh, a story of all his stories. There's the traveling in uh, Thumbelina, in, uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the Snow Queen, uh, the Little Mermaid, they are all travelers. They're moving from one situation to another. They are changing and they are moving. So traveling and Anderson's own traveling, uh, his restlessness is a part of all his stories. I think you might say. Yeah, and, and part of that is given with the folk tale genre. Yeah, because many folk tales are quest stories, and a quest is a travel. Yes, and the Little Mermaid is a quest story, obviously, and and so is uh, as you mentioned the snow the Snow Queen. Um, so. But but also, you know, Anderson wrote uh, travel books or travelogues, uh, reports from his uh, travels, you could say. And uh, his first novel, uh, The Improviser or Improvisatore, is very much uh, a kind of travelogue from, from Italy. So... <clears throat> It's not only in in the, in the fairy tales, but but in his authorship as a whole, mm. uh, his traveling is is very much a, a part of it and a main source of inspiration. Mm. For and, sure. and, and he traveled uh, surely all of his life, and um, he traveled uh, about ten years. He was uh, abroad. Uh, he was uh, in around uh, thirty countries at that time during Europe. Yeah. Uh, most of his countries in Europe, mm. he was in northern part of Africa, mm. uh, he was in uh, Turkey, mm. uh, so he was traveling around. Yeah. Uh, and another thing, there was this interesting book by Paul Binding, uh, mm -hmm. I think that was two years ago, it was published. Uh, and the title of this book is uh, Hans Christian Andersen as an European Witness. And what uh, Binding does in this uh, very good book, is, is uh, to point out that Anderson saw Europe, uh, the modern Europe, uh, become Europe in a way. Yeah. So in a way, he and he, he, he saw that it. he saw that because he traveled. Exactly. Exactly. He, he would not have been able to see the things he saw or realize the thing he realized if he'd merely stayed at home in yes. Denmark. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then some of his stories reflect, you could say, his travels in a very direct yeah. uh, way. And a very good example is uh, the quite late tale from 1867-68, uh, The Dryad, oh, yeah. uh, which is uh, in part simply a report from the, the World Exhibition in Paris mm -hmm. in 1860, that was 1867, I think. Yes. Um, so that's a very, very direct way yeah. of basing a fairy tale on a travel experience exactly but then the dryad part of it that is a retelling of in a way the story of the yeah. little mermaid with a very different ending so that gives you a lot of the complexity exactly exactly yeah. and there's a lot of uh, switzerland and so on in his stories uh, it's also the story uh, the ice uh, exactly. ice uh, ice maiden ice maiden yes yes, yes, yes. Uh, which very much reports on Anderson's travels in, in Switzerland. Yeah. We love Switzerland. Yeah. And one point uh, in the Thumbelina, of course, is the traveling from north to south. Yeah. Because the south is the real yeah. world, so to speak. And and the shadow. Yes. You also exactly. get the north-south uh, yeah. theme there in a brilliant yeah. way. So the question, Annette Pateman, really is, yes, uh, they do, the stories do reflect 
Yes. In many yes. different ways. In many different ways. And other parts of his authorship too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, then there's a question from Jennifer Menzies Go. I have completed the analysis, uh, the, the analysis, uh, analysis of the spectre. Educators analyze is very complex. Can you tell me if Hans Christian Andersen ever made known his own analysis of his work, or is it solely the work of scholars after his death? I, I think he would uh, comment upon uh, stories after writing them or when he was writing them in conversations which have then been reported by other people or in letters. Yes. But it would be, you know, short remarks. Uh, I think he, he does not differ from most other authors in that he would never do a complete interpretation of one of his own no. stories. That's, you know, uh, you could even say eliminating the work of the reader, mm -hmm. the work the reader has to do. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, uh, his way of reflecting about his own art is expressed in his art. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 in a way that makes Anderson a, a common artist. Uh, I think writers, artists, uh, are, are are not analyze and analyzing their own works. Uh, no, they, they are not. I think it's not possible to them to do that. I, I think it would be quite silly of them to do yes, that. Yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> what should we do then? Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's our work. That was our bread. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. And, and, and then there's a question from Nicola Wilson, and the question says, are you supposed to empathize with the lesser characters when they are hanged, etc., or do they just bounce back to life in other stories or to go on other worlds, I wonder? That's about execution and so on, I think. Yeah. Uh... That, that's a good question, I think. Um, I, I think you are, you are invited in honest and stories to emphasize with almost all characters, even when they are acting in hopeless ways, and even if they are marginal in the story. There's there's never there's very few characters are cast as worthless or mm -hmm. totally evil. I mean, the Snow Queen is difficult to emphasize with, but you could almost say that she, in in some ways, reigns alone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in being more or less evil personified. Yes. There's always a complexity in Anderson, uh, and 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 even. You know, in, in some of the maybe lesser known stories, like the stories about things, mm -hmm. the the thing characters, they they might be very vain, yeah, yeah, and yeah. proud, yeah. and deluded about themselves, yes, and and might meet a a terrible end, the kind of end mm -hmm. a thing can meet, yes, but you, but you're not meant to simply laugh at them. You're you're. There's also an appeal to your empathy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I and think, and I, as I said, even even marginal characters. Nobody is worthless. Yeah. No character yeah. is worthless yeah. in a story by by Anderson. So exactly. your empathy will always. Uh, yes. Should always be active. I quite agree. But but so should your level of reflection. So. And, and that's what makes the stories complex. And, and I don't know if we'll return to this, but mm -hmm. things or aspects of Arneson has all, all often been lost in translation, yes. not least the, com this kind of complexity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But in the question, I think there's something about uh, re reusing, reusing figures. And, and of course it does that. Yeah, that's, yes. that's another very important aspect yeah. that, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the dryad being a kind of retelling of the Little Mermaid. Yes, exactly. It's almost like the Little Mermaid cast again. 
uh, and now in a in a completely different setting, and in a story with a completely different and even more tragic ending. Yes, because there's no hope of salvation. Exactly, and uh, and I think uh, that might be the time to to put that question. This uh, Kirsty Hatton, she asks, how long did it take for Hans Christian Andersen to write his stories? Did he write quickly and easily, or did he spend a lot of time correcting and rewriting his stories? And I think that's interesting because uh, you, men you, you have mentioned in your thesis, Jacob, mm -hmm. uh, that in a way, this is one long story. <laughs> yeah. I would say uh, the straightforward answer would be it depends. Yes. I think some stories uh, he wrote in a, in a very inspired state and, and maybe more or less overnight. But that is an exception. Oh. Uh, many, many of his stories, he would uh, take great pains to, to finish them. He would rewrite them several times. Uh, and sometimes it would take years and years for him to complete a story. We know about the, we know about the toothache. Yeah, Auntie story. Toothache yes. is the most striking example that the first sparks for the tale might have been ignited in his youth. And uh, later in life he would return to the subject matter for some intense periods and still not be satisfied with it. Exactly. And he does not complete it until at the age of seven, 72. Exactly. And then it's also so important to him, it was not the very last one that he wrote. He wrote two after that. No. But publishing his final volume, uh, four stories, uh, and he knows for sure this is going to be my final volume of fairy tales and stories. He puts onto tooth toothache as the last one in the so, sequence. So yeah. this is my famous last words. He is literally saying so by placing it where he does. So sure, this was a lifelong toothache. It was a His lifelong. Heart was yeah. a long, a lifelong uh, yeah. toothache. And it's also very much a story of reflecting about itself. Exactly. Exactly. At this kind of yeah. meta level. Uh, so, and then there, then there are yeah. stories like the Nightingale. It was written in three days. Yeah, uh, uh, that, even that is a, a, a quite a long story. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so the question, uh, so, so, so the answer is it yes. Depends. Yes and no. It say. depends. Yes. But I think people will be surprised to learn how much time Anderson spent yeah. writing many of the stories, how many times he rewrote them until he was satisfied. Because he, he made an, a myth for himself yeah. that, uh, that the genius came and, yeah. and he just wrote. The, the myth of the romantic genius, uh, you know, just uh, sort of writing instinctively. Yes. yes. Uh, and, 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 then, and, and often nothing could be further from the truth. Exactly. And maybe this would be a good time uh, to discuss some questions about uh, children in Anderson's literature. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the asking, was he, did he write for children or, 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 or how was it? Uh, and I think at the time, at the Romantism, children uh, got a new, a new meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, because children were, uh, they had this imagination. They were innocent. That's that's a new um, that's a new experience uh, during romanticism, and and I think that's part of Anderson's way of writing and telling. It, it's an important background, yeah, cultural background, for for Anderson to begin writing fairy tales. As you as you say, mm -hmm. you could say that the Romantic era discovered the child. As a child, exactly, and not as a small adult, exactly. And of course, if you if you were poor, your children had to work from early on. So it was in the bourgeoisie, yeah, in yeah. the upper classes, yes. that it was possible to look at children in a new way and and find out that uh, the child had not to start working at an early age, but had to be educated uh, in a specific way, had to develop its imagination. Exactly. So, yes. yeah. I mean, romantic love, the child and the imagination, exactly. these are the great discoveries, or whatever you'd call it, of the romantic era. Yeah. Yeah. And the new way of looking upon the child meant we need 
a new kind of children's literature which will develop also the imagination. Exactly. So suddenly there is a market for fairy tales. Yes. And in Danish and Scandinavian literature, I think Andersen simply was the first to mention the word fantasia or imagination. Mm. That imagination is some power uh, within you and, and, and it's bound to, to children and artists, as you said. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, but, but it was not merely, I think there was another question about that. It's not merely a matter of cool calculation. Oh, yeah, exactly. From Anderson, but, but I think he saw the opportunity. But, but then uh, this very, very early fairy tale, which was discovered some four years ago, yes. Uh, yes. the tallow candle, which he probably wrote at an age of 17, 18. It proves that the fairy tale ch genre was close to him yeah. right from the start. Exactly. And from listening to folk tales when a child himself. So it's not just cool calculation, but there is a window. Exactly. And uh, as I say, he's experimenting from the start. What can you get away with? Yeah. And very soon, I think he realizes that he can do things in this short genre that he couldn't do in his novels, couldn't do in his travel books, couldn't do in his plays or dramas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why he keeps on and also transforms the fairy tale genre beyond recognition in many ways. Exactly. And that's why we talk not just about his fairy tales, but about his fairy tales and stories, and stories yes. his short prose, yes. which is absolutely unique in, yeah. Yeah. In, well, in world literature, that output. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. That he, part of his authorship. Yeah. He broke fruit to a, a new genre. Yeah. It wasn't such Several a new genres, perhaps. Several. Even. Several, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Within the genre of mm. short prose. Yeah. Broadly speaking, so uh, mm. I think that was uh, Judy McHarry Tijani uh, asking, uh, "How was it about Anderson and, and the children?" And I, I think you 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 get an answer of that. But you might say, "Did Anderson uh, tell for children? Did he like children?" Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. <laughs> Again, it depends. Yeah. I mean, some of his stories are certainly not uh, written uh, with that with an audience of children in mind. Others are. Mm, exactly. uh, but 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 those who are written with an audience for children in mind are not merely intended for an audience of children. He's always thinking of the adult reader or the adult reading aloud as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, none of the stories are Stories for children, pure and simple. No, no. Simply none of them. No, exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, there's a Danish uh, Andersen scholar, uh, he's called Søren Bargesen, mm. uh, never mind. Uh, but he uh, developed a nice phrase or term uh, relating to this aspect uh, about, you can say, the double narration. He, he, he calls it the double articulation. Yes. yes. So the children will listen to the story, react to it in their more immediate way, but but the adult reading aloud or reading for him or herself exactly. can start thinking about what he or she is reading exactly. and, and might be kept busy for a long time yeah. thinking about it. There's uh, some questions about uh, Hans Christian Andersen and uh, Christianity, and I think that might be a good uh, bridge to that question, because mm -hmm. uh, when Andersen um, um, of his first stories for uh, um, fairy tales told for children. I think there might be uh, uh, some inspiration from the Holy Bible because it says you have to be like a child or, or you wouldn't go to heaven in a way. Yeah, and that, of course, that's the main motif of the Snow Queen. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. So there's a question here. Um, well, also, was Hans Christian Andersen a strict Lutheran. Uh, his frequent allusions to the uh, good Lord was that Lutheranism. Mm -hmm. uh, and was the ointment used by the boy, the helper, in both the riddle and the Hans Christian Andersen stories a reference to the Holy Christian mm -hmm. used in confirmation? Well, I'm not sure. Um, but so maybe. I mean, but, you could yeah. just start from the question whether he was a strict Lutheran. Yes, exactly. exactly yeah. Yes. It's a good idea. Uh, I think 
famously Anderson's father was what we call a kind of free thinker. Oh. Uh, yeah. So so that's uh, one influence, probably an important influence in his life. Uh, but his environment would have been Protestant, yeah. Lutheran, yeah. when a child. And and I, I don't think he's he's ever kind of consciously broken with Lutheranism in any way. Mm. I think he's basically a Lutheran, yeah, but not necessarily a strict one. No, no, exactly. No. no. Yeah, exactly. And then I think the the inspiration of the free thinker is is uh, seminal, extremely important, yeah. because I think he is very much experimenting again in his stories with various takes on religion if you can phrase yeah. it that way yeah. various takes on yeah. christianity trying to see aspects of religion and christianity from different angles so you can never pin down his exactly. position exactly. in any kind of orthodox ways and that's that's impossible yes and that's great because that makes him universal in a way uh, it's uh, very easy. Uh, yeah, we we, we have uh, we, we we know that it's very easy to read for people <coughs> from other cultures. Yeah, because there's no dogmatic Lutheran. Yeah, but I think one of one of the and now I'm getting a little I'm moving ahead of ourselves in a way, but I think one very interesting story or tale, fairy tale, when this question or in relation to this question is of course the red shoes. Yes, yes, because. I mean, this is, for me, also a, a kind of experiment. I mean, it's it's a terrible story, yeah. read literally, yeah. but 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 basically, thematically, it's also. I think it's certainly about the Old Testament versus the New Testament, and maybe it's about the Catholic faith versus Protestant faith. Yes. Not giving any straight answers, mm. but but those are yeah. positions exactly. which are in play in this terrible story. Yeah, yeah. But it's not merely a moralistic story. Thou shall not be vain. Exactly. It's very yeah. much about yeah. uh, how do you judge other people, and how does that reflect back on yourself? I think. Yeah. But I'm getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> well, <laughs> and uh, as Hans Christian Andersen was a child, he was he was a listener. He listened to so many stories. His father he was a, as you, saw, uh, as you said, uh, a free thinker. Uh, but there was all those seamen and soldiers and so on in in, in the city, and and he was a listener. Uh, he listened to all these stories and myths and uh, and some of them terrible stories. Uh, and uh, he, he was reading uh, Arabian Nights and uh, other literature. So so there's a lot of inspirations, uh, and they. Uh, well, formed his his way of being a Christian. You might yeah. say yes, yes, yeah. There's a lot of good questions here. Certainly. Catherine Emmett asks, "How do you think Anderson would respond to the intense scrutiny and, and analysis of his works, his motivation and his choice of a children's genre to express his adult ideas, some unsuitable for children, perhaps?" Yeah, we we've talked a bit last sorry, about sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah uh, that one deserted. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> no, we have we have discussed uh, aspects of this already. Yeah, I think. I, think uh, so. I mean, he Anderson was very uh, uh, conscious about, worried about. Uh, you could say his literary afterlife. Mm. I mean, the the theme of immortality is double. Uh, in Anderson, yeah. it's uh, the worry about what what happens to uh, the human being, to the soul uh, after death. That's one, of course, yes. religious question which yes. troubled Anderson uh, certainly. But then also the the kind of the literary immortality. You could say, exactly. will I enter the the canon or, or won't yes. I? Yes. Uh, uh, like Shakespeare did, uh, one uh, uh, notorious example. Uh, so this kind of double worry, and this, since we've talked about onto toothache, yes. onto toothache is also about this double worry. Yes, exactly. About, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two kinds of 
and especially about uh, literary immortality. Mm -hmm. So Anderson certainly wanted to go down in history as a great writer yeah. of tales and perhaps other things. Yes. <laughs> um, what would he think about being scrutinized and, and analyzed? Well, that's difficult to say. He would, uh, I mean, th that's why I, I love working with death, dead authors because they can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good answer. <laughs> yeah. mm. Exactly. Yes. But I, I think he he would be happy that he is still being read and analyzed yeah. because he might not agree with how he's being analyzed and read, but being read exactly and yes. still being considered interesting yeah. and a part of the canon. And I mean and that work is ongoing. Uh, so so maybe he would even be happy when when someone says, "Hey, this is not just for children." Exactly. Yeah. And when yeah. someone says, "Hey, this hasn't been translated properly," mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think yeah. Uh, yeah. he would like to be taken seriously. I, I think Still, so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And and mm -hmm. yes, and to be interested in, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's some. And also, you could say being related to other great writers from the canon. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 There are some questions about did Anderson uh, know about the, the models, uh, you know, uh, the actensile model and, and so on. Uh, and, and, and the easy question, the easy answer is no, he wasn't. <laughs> no, but then you have to, to look at how did the actensile model evolve? Well, it, it evolves from work done in the 1920s in, in Russia on uh, on Russian folk tales, identifying basic structures present in all folk tales, and and those Russian folk tales are more or less represented, representative mm. or, or like uh, fairy tale traditions from from other, you know, what should we say, Western, Occidental yeah. countries yeah. like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Germany. Uh, and so on. So you got these basic elements yes. uh, from the folk tale, and 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 they are there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they can then be arranged in a model like the actensial model, and that's what has been done. Yes, exactly. But that means what 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 the actensial model represents is something ingrained to the fairy tale tradition going back to time immemorial. Yes. And Anderson knew his fairy tale tradition. Exactly. So he did not know the actential model. It would have been no surprise to him. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, well, I think that's that was a very good answer because yes, exactly. Yes. Um, well, um, what are we doing? Um, I think Tammy Tammy Carter put a question here. Has Christian Anderson changed his style of writing to appeal to a younger audience by doing so? Gave these stories to readers for the next almost two hundred years. Yes, uh, if he had continued writing in his uh, style of the Spectre, yeah, these, the verbose style. Of yeah, the yeah, yes, sorry, yeah. yes, yes. These tales might never have become known worldwide. I think that's that's correct. It's correct, so, and uh, and it also kind of implicates uh, a paradox or two. Because, because it, in one way, it is very, very true mm -hmm. that if Anderson had not dared, you could also almost say, do the leap or the jump, yeah, and 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 blow up the genres, yes. yeah, and 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 especially, you know, develop this style of writing. You could say his feigned orality. You know, breaking with so many rules of grammar and punctuation yes, exactly. uh, that it would provoke uh, his his critics endlessly. Mm -hmm. uh, what he did to the Danish language, if he hadn't done that, exactly, he he would have remained a parenthesis in literary history. But but then the true radicality of what he did in Danish, I mean, and is still radical. In many ways, it has not been translated, and that's a paradox. Yes, exactly. Yes, that he yes. still achieved this kind of global 
recognition and fame, especially as a writer of fairy tales for children, uh, because of the new style that he developed, when you kind of compare with the spectre. Yeah. But this style has not been properly translated. Exactly. exactly. So that's 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 a paradox. The mind-boggling paradox. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And, and 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 some of that's because Anderson was very oral in his mind. Uh, in a way, he told oral stories, but he did that, of course, in uh, in writing. Yeah, so I say you you sh you should remember that that this is, and and he's not necessarily writing uh, the way he would tell a story to children. No. And and people arguing in that way merely they only refer to the tinderbox, yeah. and it is much more complex than that. So I would say it's it's a feigned reality. And 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 he is creating a narrator, a kind of narrator, un, unseen, yeah, or unheard, yeah. or unread yeah. before. And 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 this some aspects of this narrator that he develops exactly. or narrative style yeah. are very modern. Yeah, I yeah. mean something like he's sometimes in, in there are instances of what could be free indirect discourse mm -hmm. before this technique has even been invented and that that's merely because yeah it's you could say it's 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 a side effect of the anarchistic but also calculated way yeah. that yeah. is yeah. telling narrating his stories but it is interesting that sense question Emerson uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he renewed Danish and all modern Danish uh, dictionaries they are referring to to Anderson, yeah. uh, which renews the Danish language. Yeah. So it is, yeah. as you I mean, said, a paradox. I mean, it, uh, how how to translate it? Of course, there's the Bible and, and Anderson exactly. in 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 two main sources of renewal of the Danish language. It's like in England, it's it's Shakespeare and the King James Bible. Exactly, exactly. Yes, I think <clears throat> we have to humble ourselves and and say that Shakespeare has been even more influential upon English than unless and upon Danish. Okay, yeah. okay, ah, we make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Um, yeah, what kind of questions you for take? Uh, I think uh, oh, this yeah. is uh, this story, uh, this question, sorry, from uh, Subhan uh, yes, yes. We we have in a way answered it, but I think we could we could still uh, we might uh, say something new if we if we address it. It uh, it goes. In your opinion, did Anderson purposely write his fairy tales with the structural devices and models we have explored in mind, probably? Uh, and if so, why? Or was it more of a subconscious decision and his natural style of writing? And what impact does this create? Yeah. I mean, this this touches very much, you could say, the life nerve of, of, of this online course, uh, the tales we've chosen, because these fairy tale elements or structures are present or are underlying mm. in each and every case. So did he do this purposely? Yes, I think so. Mm. But but then there's the, the, the question of how do you discuss the purpose of a of an author or a writer, especially a dead one, <laughs> you can't ask him or her. Uh, what what's cal what's calculated? What's on purpose? What is inspiration? Exactly. There's this strange thing called inspiration. Mm -hmm. But as I said, Anderson knew the basic elements of the folk tale which were later uh, mm. used or conceptualized by means of these models. He knew them, and in a way, instinctively or whatever, he'd analyzed them to the core, and therefore he could use them and manipulate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the case, I think. Yes, exactly. And yeah. you could purposely, inspirational, I mean, it's not all inspiration, because as we've also, uh, commented upon uh, he, he might work again and again or rewrite the same story again and again 
so so certainly there was a kind of purpose yeah. and thinking going on yeah as it, it wasn't just the romantic genius to return to that mm. uh, and i think about uh, this uh, that anderson of course was a romantic uh, the poet and so on uh, but uh, but but he still is uh, is alive and global and, and i think that would be interesting michael lent got a question uh, if i may be permitted another question he says do you see any writers you might consider to be the modern day equivalent of anderson i think that's a good question it's a very good question it's a very good question you, you might think of harry potter um, you might think of Astrid Lindgren from Sweden, um, but but, but, but I would say no. Yeah, exactly. I would say nobody could perfect this double articulation exactly to the degree. I mean, I mean, uh, Astrid Lindgren is a great writer. Yes, for children, for children, which adults can certainly also appreciate. Oh yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, I enjoyed reading Harry Potter for my son. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Also, fine when I finally could do it in English when he was old enough for that, uh, because it's also certain, you know, this uh, play with language going on, exactly. diagonally yes. and, and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. So. I I think and I think that there are lots of adult readers enjoying uh, Harry oh, yes. Potter, but 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 the same sophistication and and you could say the ability in some of Anderson's stories to peel still appeal to the child while operating at so different a level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. When addressing the adult reader, I mean I can think of no comparison. No. But maybe uh, Anderson, in that way, is bound to, to, to his time in a way. Uh, he yeah. is a romantic, uh, and we are. In he is. Uh, I mean, that's the starting point. Yeah. He is offspring of the exactly. romantic breakthrough. Yes, exactly. And he exactly. Uh, he goes in his own direction, all directions from that starting point. Yeah. 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 Maybe we should uh, uh, we should uh, welcome Torsten. Through Thompson. Thank you. Uh, our great very colleague much. Uh, and our very smart PhD student. <laughs> you, you're so welcome. Thank you, Jules. Thank I, you. I think you should say hello to. Hello, to everyone. World. Hello, everyone watching. I am so sorry for being late, but I had some trouble getting here with the public transport. But now I'm here. And uh, how far are you through the questions? Oh, um, I think we. Uh, Almost through most of them. So, oh, okay. So, so and uh, I arrived late too, and yeah. as I mentioned, because yeah. of the same traffic accident on the motorway, <laughs> only Torsten was in a bus, and and yeah. I was in a car, yeah. and uh, Very therefore I got here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. 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 Yeah. So, so uh, I don't even know how how much. Oh, uh, about ten minutes uh, left. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. So, 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 Torsten, if if you think there are some questions. That, mm -hmm. that you you sort of burn of answering yeah please well there was um several of them i found your questions really good um and uh, some of them really thought-provoking um i think you've already you've probably already talked about it but one of the things that uh, seems to be coming up uh, again and again at this um uh at, at this online education is uh, where are the boundaries of reading um, mm. How far can we go when we're reading these fairy tales? And um, there are a couple of questions that address this. Um, the question of uh, if uh, Hans Christian Andersen ever made known his own analysis of his work, or if it's solely the scholars uh, that are doing this after his death. And uh, again, if he could anticipate this kind of intense reading and scrutiny of his, uh, of his work. Um, and I think that's a really good question, because when you are um, dealing with literary analysis um, like we do on a regular basis, mm. it seems completely obvious that we can just do this and, and where the limits somehow are or where they are. Um, but I think that could be, I can understand why that can be interesting from uh, from uh, another point of view to, to, to discuss mm. how you can do this. Um, 
And I, I don't, I don't think I have any uh, clear answer because maybe that's exactly the point that uh, that these boundaries are are meant to be continuously uh, negotiated. We, we need to continuously ask ourselves, how do we read? How can we read? Uh, and in general, you could say that there are several uh, positions that have been discussing all through uh, the, the the history of literary uh, yeah. and comparative literature yeah. and literary theory. How is how is the good or how is the good analysis made? Mm. And there's been several proposals. Yeah, I think mm. you can never make uh, a good analysis without making a bold move. No, that's uh, if, if you don't do that, you you'll merely repeat what has been said before. When yeah. that is said. Uh, you know, certain positions or schools within literary criticism are very relativistic. Some put all stress on the reader, like the reader creates the text. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no text until the reader has made his or her interpretation. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and, and other positions uh, mm -hmm. have been accused of relativism and anything goes where I think it's a very unfair mm. uh, criticism, mm. but uh, mm. it's just to 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 say that uh, there's there's criticism from the outside of literary criticism, and and there is there are positions within literary criticism which are very relativistic yeah. uh, on their own accord. But as I say, you have to make a bold move. But uh, in my book, there's no limit. No. as to how far you can go mm. but but you can never change the text what the text says no exactly. and if you start manipulating the text in order to get at what you want yeah then no go for me yeah i would yeah. say so too if you deliberately and, and if you deliberately forget about you know in aniston's case his time yeah the, the thinking of mm. his time you have to whatever the text says you also have to relate to uh what was taking place at the time yeah. in, in thinking and literature. That does not mean, but, that, but that's also to be able to say, well, here Anasen is fact, in fact very much ahead of his time. Yeah, if you I definitely the case of Anasen. I definitely think that the, yeah that you yeah, that you should consider the the historical context and that it can in, inform an analysis on a really profound level. But on the other hand, I also think we also read like ancient tragedies today to see what they can tell us about, I don't know, domestic policy. And we read Shakespeare and uh, for, for what it can tell us about, I don't know, contemporary uh, Danish foreign policy, mm. for instance. Mm. Um, so I also think that there can be some really interesting uh, things that appear when you do a deliberately anachronistic reading, for mm -hmm. example. I think it can get interesting when you do that as well. Mm -hmm. Of, of maybe, course, of maybe course. Maybe we should uh, relate. Uh, yeah. to, that's a put a question in the blue. Oh yeah, uh, there's a... there. Yes, uh, because that is a question of the yeah. uh, actantial model. Should I read it aloud? Yeah, do it. Yes, uh, do that. Please. Hello, could you comment on some practical applications of the actantial model in literary analysis, please? That are different and more substantial than Louis uh, Ebert's. I find myself interested in the model, but it seems two-dimensional. Thanks so much. I'm not familiar with the uh, with the uh, the person who is mentioned here. Um, no. So I I wouldn't be able to offer any analysis. I, I'm 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 sure the model can be practically applied. Mm -hmm. Uh, in in many ways, because it it deals with such you know basic aspects of many kinds of narrative. Because I mean, lots of modern, more modern genres than fairy tales are still quest stories, you know, adventure mm -hmm. novels and so on. Yeah. Uh, so it is a very universal model when addressing certain genres, certain kinds of literature and film and and so on. Mm. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the use that we try to make of it uh, within the limits of this online course is speci specifically designed towards the case of Anderson, And that is, we use it as a model to register when Anderson starts deviating from basic mm. obvious structures. And, and, and so I think we use, and the way we use the model in a very in its most basic and and, and least sophisticated mm. uh, way 
simply as a kind of seismograph, uh, uh, giving us uh, a kind of tool to detect, wow, now we know Anderson knows all about these elements and structures, now he starts manipulating, yeah. mm -hmm. now he starts playing on exactly. them, now it gets interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a new question. Would you say a lot of, of uh, Hans and the other Grimm's is influenced heavily on Christianity and suffering? With the number of symbols in comparison, in comparison, would you say that the pagans wrote anonymously? Oh, I'm sorry. It, uh, we have to go back if we can. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can. Oh, we really have a time limit here. Yes. That's a, stress, a bit stressful. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. It was a question. Yeah, about Christianity yes. and the Grimm yes. brothers and. Well, I do have a problem with the technique. I can't see the question. I'm sorry for that. It also seems that it's a bit frozen now. Yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's uh, suddenly not business story. We've, we've got a little technical <laughs> problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, it's it's a question behind here. Yeah. And then there was the next one. No. No. There's, there's one we. It was a question of of Grimm. Yeah, and Christianity and yes. and how that influenced uh, the writings. Yeah, um, uh, I, I find it difficult to answer uh, the question when about the Grimm brothers. Uh, I would say uh, the the folktale genre is not Christian in any way. It, it dates exactly. back before Christianity. It's a uh, exactly. and it's a quite neutral formulation. You could say it's a pagan genre. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they have been christened, uh, to speak in that way, by, by the Grimm brothers very much. No. Uh, no but, 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 that, but it's very important to, to point to the difference that the Grimm brothers, they're certainly editing. They may, might also be sanitizing uh, to some extent. But, but they are transmitting, rewriting folk tales. Whereas Anderson did that in a few in instances, but other than that, Anderson is writing mm. his own tales. Mm, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the questions about uh, Christianity and religion uh, raised by An what uh, An by Anderson's tales, uh, it's it's a completely different matter yes. from from exactly. from the folk tales written and perhaps edited, uh, written down and perhaps edited by the Grimm brothers. Yeah, exactly. Two very different things. Yeah. And there were hundreds of uh, experience in the Grimm stories. Mm. Uh, Anderson mm. was a unique story, yes. And then there's a question. Mm. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. If Anderson were a contemporary author, I believe that he would be a great film script writer. Do you agree? I think that's yeah. a very funny question. Yeah. And the, the, the very Good question is what kind of a film script exactly writer. exactly yes maybe a Steven Spielberg uh, kind of mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and maybe maybe a marginal avant-garde uh, yes yes because he might as well be that yeah and that's mm -hmm. a complexity I think yeah exactly and, and yeah at his time he was uh, and I think maybe uh, we get the question because he's so good at evoking images yeah yeah I think so too because, because uh, he he wouldn't necessarily be great at writing you know popular plots no no in fact they can get really uh, twisted and difficult sometimes the plots so so it i think it's because of the very vivid imagery that we, is we will get to language. the to the question what what uh, what disney will have to do yeah with a <laughs> little exactly. mermaid in order to get a plot which will work for a modern audience out of it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I think it's the same one asking now. My question is about theater and its influence oh, yeah. in Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, question because Hans Christian Andersen was very fascinated with the theater, and he himself, as a as a young man, wanted to uh, first sing and exactly. then dance, then dance. Uh, at the theater. So he had a great venerance for uh, for theater, uh, and in some cases he incorporates theater a lot in his writings. In his uh, debut novel, the Imp Improvisatore, I think it's called in English. Yeah, probably. He yeah. he writes a lot about Italy and uh, the theater scene in Italy. Yeah, exactly. I think you might point to something else that uh, his ability 
also in developing his new narrative style, his ability to kind of keep things short, uh, brief, stick to the minimal presentation of a new character, whatever, might be influenced by his early experiences also with theatre. Yeah. Mm. Uh, because you put a character on stage, you can't exactly. tell a long, uh, you can't prepare that for ages, tell a long story about background or anything. Mm. You put the character on yeah. stage. Yeah. yeah. And that's and in a way very element. modernistic. Uh, yeah. And, and I think it. he also transforms that to being economical, you could say, yeah. in other ways that merely the presentation of a character, yes. Yes. but saying things in very few words and so on. Yeah. 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 And there's some kind of, of a meeting every between the, the old uh, tradition and, and the modernity in, yeah. in that putting characters on a stage. But we have to point out that he, he wrote about uh, 50 plays. Yeah, 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 yes, of, yes, course. of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and there's a new question. Yeah, and that ties into the one the thing I was talking about before. By considering exactly. the stories against a model the author had no concept of when he wrote them, are we in danger of overanalyzing at the risk of missing the message, wisdom, or moral of the stories? Well, first of all, I don't think that any of the stories has that clear a moral. So I don't no. think that, that there is a... a and and I, I think we have already answered that question yeah. when, when, right. as we, yeah. when yeah. we discussed the principles of... Yeah. Both uh, the principles of literary criticism analysis mm -hmm. and basi the, basically what, what, what does the model potential model yeah. reflects yeah well it is based upon reflects the very fairy tale tradition that Anderson was familiar with yeah which is his starting point yeah and so, again we should mm. underline that it is a a tool yeah. for opening yeah. a discussion and it is by no means an exhaustive an analysis mm. that comes out of this model yeah would there be any more questions i think we have one more do you think we lack new writers yes. of fairy tales and even folk tales today? And is there a need or opening for new fairy tales? Well, I think you just mentioned Harry Potter yeah. earlier. Yeah. I think that is actually some, uh, I think a, a lot of fairy tale like uh, things are being produced. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that it's a tradition that has been completely lost. I think there are fairy tales in a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, you might say stories today. Yeah, uh, it's uh, all around the world in a way. There yeah. will always be a need for new yeah. imaginations and uh, a new. Uh, I mean, you you, you you can't you can't say we we need new folk tales at least. No, 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 no you folk can't. tales can only originate yeah, from exactly, the people. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, in a in a specific yeah. context somehow. Yeah. yeah. So you might say that. New folk tales might be circulating on exactly. the, the world wide web. Uh, yeah, maybe. the modern way of communicating. Yes. Uh, but yeah. I, I do think we're seeing we're witnessing a renaissance in uh, in uh, in popular culture with the fairy tale right at the moment. Yeah. Uh, in mm. in different uh, uh, productions, Hollywood productions are mashing up these fairy tales, making yeah. them into action movies all the time, mm. drawing upon this folk tale and fairy tale material. Yeah. 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 And maybe the folk, folk tale uh, material in uh, up music, yeah, in uh, rock and roll, and so so on. I think that's a, a modern way of telling mm -hmm. myths and stories. And now there's a new question. Yes. Hi. Uh, must we follow the home away home or the accidental model if we are to write a modern day fairy tales, a modern day fairy tales? Uh, what I meant is that can uh, one totally deviate from the models and exclude the usual accidental characters like princess, king, helper, etc. I would say, of course, you can deviate as, as much as you want, but devi deviating means still keeping a kind of contact with or connection to the original. Um, but of course, the, these models reflect ways of life mm. in, in a very basic sense. Mm like the home away home, like you have to leave, uh, you could almost relate it to the incest taboo, you have to, to leave, uh, as we say in Danish, the skirts of your mother and her cooking and uh, find, go, go through a phase developing yourself in order to form a new family. So the home away home, 
mm. home number two is the new home and it's exactly. it, it's how we how we do not get in bread as human beings that goes back to time immemorial to use that phrase mm. again it's very basic uh the actential model also reflects some very very basic things mm. uh, but you could say, say that uh um ways of life also change and yeah. and mm. rapidly yeah. And, yeah and might at least uh demand or open up for for new kinds of deviations from mm. these basic models mm. yeah. yeah and that's probably reflected in in all sorts of writings yeah. also fairy tale right now i think you're you're in a way answered the question put by stephen doherty mm. Mm. Uh, it's a new question but uh, it's uh yeah it's it, under deviation too yeah did hans feel that the structure for the folktale the home away home pattern and the actential model let down children as being avid readers because they are emotionless characters being flat whereas hands needed to break or deviate to evoke children um i think yes and no oh, um he's he certainly i mean i mean his his stories are also challenging challenging for for children yeah in in some of the ways they're deviating which i think children will instinctively understand um but at the same time you you can't ignore that that in a way many of Anderson's characters are also flat yeah. and, and mm -hmm. the, the the deviations are not in necessarily more complex characters it, it might be more complex what's happening to them yeah that's true yeah but they are not necessarily yeah. deeper or rounder yeah good Let's see if there are any more questions. Okay, it doesn't uh, seem to show up more questions. Uh, uh, at the does time. that mean job done or where are we? Um, maybe, uh, maybe uh, let's, uh, let's look at the questions here. Mm. Oh, okay. Ah, sorry. Yeah, we have another one. Uh, it says Anderson first had popular and critical success with the Improvisatore, yet mm. his children's stories were overlooked for some time. Was children's literature considered a lower art form at that time? Was it considered a poor choice or art that Anderson continued to write both adults and children's literature at the same time? Who finally discovered his children's work? Children, adults, critics. Can I just add? Yeah, 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 that's yeah, a very probably. good question. Yes, um, yes. Actually, um, I, I think that from what we know, it wasn't as prestigious to write children's stories in this period of time at all. And that's also why Anderson started with the improvisatory. Actually, he, he did have, have his literary debut before that, but this was considered his big literary debut. And there's a reason for that, because this, at this period in time, the absolute most prestigious genre was the novel, mm -hmm. the big romantic novel. That was what you had to do. Uh, and that's also why it gets its name, uh, because in, in German, uh, romantic is, is, yeah, it has the word romaine inside of it, which is the novel. Hmm. So it's the genre is actually named after that particular, uh, or that that period in time, that stylistic era is named after that specific uh, genre, and also I believe that Anderson was actually criticized for his fairy tales to begin with because they weren't proper fairy tales; they didn't have a clear moral. And at this point, some very influential Danish critic was uh, making these anthologies of uh, of uh, fairy tales and chose only to include, I believe it's the Steadfast Tin Soldier, oh. because that was the one that fitted the model most, uh, the, well, basically the home away home model. It's, exactly. it's, it's very clear, it clearly follows that one. And it's the one uh, that's most clearly a fairy tale. Uh, they had did trouble recognizing his other uh, fairy tales as proper fairy tales fit for children. So this discussion that we're having, whether it's Fit for uh, whether whether it's pure fairy tales and whether it's fit for children was actually also something that went on yeah. at Hans Christian Andersen's own time. So that was just yeah yeah. yeah. 
Now there's a new question here uh, from uh, Christian Harpoff. I've just joined, uh, so you may already have answered this. In the traveling companion, your analysis points out a large amount of Christian symbols. My question is, was Hans Christian Andersen a committed Christian? Uh, yeah, we have kind of uh, discussed this already. Yeah. yeah. Then we, we were asked about whether he was a strict Luther, Lutheran. Yeah. Whether he's a committed Christian is kind of exactly. slightly different question. Yeah, yes, exactly. I think he was a committed Christian. Yes. Uh, but I think his uh, Christianity was, uh, in a way, a, a kind but of... But never orthodox. Na exactly. It was a kind of naive Christianity. I, I, I would be careful to say naive. Very oh, okay, careful. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but where, well, but it, he was sure no, no dogmatic. No, not dogmatic. No, no, not uh, dogmatic. That's um, very open-minded Christianity, in a way. So, so, so yeah. you're right, not naive. No, open-minded. Open-minded. Searching. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. And very... Yeah, very interested in uh, questions of theology. Yeah, and yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Also, at, inter at also interested in uh, other religions, of exactly, course, and exactly, uh, matters exactly. of faith. Uh, yeah. And I think it's important that at his time there was a discussion going on in uh, Europe and in Denmark, especially about about how to be Christian. Mm. Uh, that, that it's, it starts at this uh, very point in time. Exactly. It's uh, and that's mm, a thing. Yeah, but it, but even more in, in I think uh, in in Germany, Anderson yeah. was very much uh, following, interested in, and and maybe a little scared of also as a committed Christian. He was quite scared about some of the tendencies in in Germany at this point in time. Yeah, but he was not so scared that he ran away. He was too open-minded. Mm, exactly. So he he. He takes up some of these discussions in one of his novels uh, called, well, yes, To Be or Not To Be, uh, quite an ambitious yeah. title. Yeah. Um, but but what, what was happening in Germany was, you know, uh, the, the total break with any kind of fundamentalist reading of the Bible, any kind of reading of mm. the Bible as reflecting the word of God. Uh, so the new way of reading the Bible is called, you know, the the the, the historical, yeah. the historical way of reading. I mean, which is a kind of you know scholarly reading, trying to interpret what does this text mean philologically. Yes. Uh, you simply have to start uh, studying uh, Hebrew properly, uh, or, or or ancient Greek or, or whatever language of which part of mm. the Bible we're mm. dealing with. Um, so, so, so this is not the word of God. This is written by exactly. people at a certain time in history and has to be understood on exactly. the basis of that. Yeah. And that was radically new. Yes, that was a breakthrough in Christianity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that makes uh, the modern kind of, of, of Christianity uh, in, yeah. like in a way. You know, a sort of uh, cultural based christianity mm. more than a dogmatic mm. christianity mm. so uh, so that was the 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 one you could almost say the 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 challenge from within uh, christianity itself the historical way of reading but then also of course all what all what was taking place within the the, the natural sciences yeah, exactly. also challenged traditional views mm. And and all of this is reflected in in Anderson. exactly from start to finish almost you could say. Yeah, and it would be important to uh, to point out that he was a close friend to Hans Christian Ersted. Yeah, that, that, that's physician. good. Good because the question was who who was the first to recognize exactly. the value of Anderson's yeah. fairy yeah. tales? That was the Danish natural scientist and philosopher exactly. who Hans Christian Ersted, uh who discovered uh, electromagnetism? Electromagnetism. Yes. I think it's also in English. Uh, I, th I think that's a word, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. We hope it so. Must, it must be. <laughs> yes. I it, think it, it, it almost has to be. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think. Okay. We should, uh, uh, we should mention that Stephen uh, Doherty says. Uh, yeah. I think this. Thank, will you. Have to, thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe. Thank you.
we should uh, then take the opportunity to say thank you too. It's been a very great pleasure to uh, discuss with you and, and with each other. And uh, we're very sorry about this traffic incident, which yeah, well, yeah, delayed me sorry. slightly and delayed uh, Torsten terribly much. Yeah. Uh, but we uh, we managed, I think, to to have a good discussion amongst ourselves and most of all with you. Yeah. And uh, we thank you for the very good questions that were sent in beforehand and for the ones that uh, were sent in uh, while we were in the air. And uh, that was a great pleasure. I, I hope we we had to be very attentive. Uh, we might have missed one or two of, of those uh, that came in while we were transmitting. So I hope you will forgive us that and understand that. It wasn't the, the easiest uh, <laughs> conditions we were working under, but it's been a great pleasure. And uh, we have one more session later on planned, and uh, we look forward uh, to that very much too. And then we will be more experienced. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yes, yeah. so thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. From thank all you of us much. to all of you. Yeah, all around the world, and uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, Good night. Uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> See you.